History shows that those who have the power to vote have been reluctant to share that power because in a civilized society, voting truly is the ultimate means of getting anything done. People in power know that if you give that right to everyone, they themselves may feel the wrath of those they have oppressed or taken advantage of, and fear of that trumps considerations about equal rights under the law. However, as we have evolved our voting process, we have become less and less hypocritical as a nation. It started after the Civil War with the Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery in 1865. The 14th Amendment gave equal protection under the law for all persons in 1868. And the 15th Amendment prohibits discrimination in voting rights of citizens on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, society and cultures being what they are, just because lawmakers pass laws doesn't mean everyone jumps up and down in joy. Racism and sexism are as old as mankind, and we don't give up our prejudices just because some lawmaker in some far-off place tells us that we've been thinking wrong all our lives. Change of this kind usually takes generations to take hold, because racism and sexism, for the most part, are learned from our parents and educators. Laws may be enacted to make it more difficult to openly discriminate, but that doesn't mean that the people who are doing the discriminating have changed at all. It's their sons and daughters who are going to slowly but surely change their attitudes and teach these new ideas and standards to their kids, and so on down the line. When we're talking about bringing equal rights under the law to every person in a country, we're talking about fighting not just centuries, but millennia of ingrained thinking patterns against minorities and women. The 14th Amendment is perhaps one of the most powerful pieces of legislation ever passed in not only the United States, but the entire world. So it's no big surprise that it was fought from day one by the South, who wanted no part of blacks being given equal rights, and that Section 1 of this amendment has been one of the most litigated parts of the Constitution ever since. Section 1 states, quote, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws." Unquote. Can you think of anything that sounds more common sense than this? Yet litigation about this has been fierce, and cases circling this section have been the cause of not just some dinner table arguments, but actual violence and death. For example, it was litigation over this clause which gave us abortion rights and same-sex marriage. It took intense work over this amendment for Brown versus Board of Education to happen in 1954, nearly a hundred years after the amendment was passed, to finally end racial segregation. And we all know what a struggle that was. There are some people who have very deeply vested interests in keeping the rest of us from having equal rights under the law. Whether their reasons are religious, political, or economic, we still have a long way to go before all of us will truly be on a level playing field. So, it's no surprise that while the language of the Reconstruction Amendments should have included women's right to vote, it did not. On the heels of abolitionism came women's suffrage. This was a long, hard battle waged by determined women such as Garrett Smith, Elizabeth Stanton, Lucy Stone, and Susan B. Anthony. 
women's right to vote was first granted in Wyoming, of all places, in 1869, followed by neighboring Utah in 1870, and then Idaho and Colorado before the end of the 19th century. It's probably important to note that these were all Western pioneer states at the time. The 19th Amendment was finally ratified in 1920, prohibiting state or federal sex-based restrictions on voting. However, as I said before, just because a law was passed didn't mean everyone was happy about it. Minorities and women still had major hurdles to jump before they would be considered truly equal before the law. For example, when the Supreme Court decided on Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, Southern whites in Virginia began what they called a massive resistance led by State Senator Harry Byrd. They closed schools and even an entire school system to attempt to block racial integration and passed state laws to fight the federal ruling. This was the same state that had adopted a new constitution back in 1902 specifically to disenfranchise black voters and keep black school kids away from whites. And they are only one example of the slow burn that white supremacists felt about federal laws giving equal rights to blacks and women. We see this same kind of thing happening right now in North Carolina with that state fighting federal laws giving equal rights to LGBT citizens. All of these states were on the wrong side of history, and many of them have now turned away from their racist background and gotten with the program. But it took a massive push from enlightened citizens and forward thinkers in government to push these states out of the dark ages.